Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Episode 36 of Word of Honor has recently been released on YouTube and I'm here to talk about the ending. I'll be talking about episode 36 and also the Easter egg scene that was separately released. Um, so obviously this video is going to contain a lot of spoilers. If you want a spoiler free review then please check out my other video which I've linked below. The ending of Word of Honor is confusing and ambiguous, especially if you thought episode 36 was the end and you didn't know about the extra Easter egg scene that was separately released. In this video, I'll be talking about what the drama showed, I'll briefly talk about um, how the novel ended, and then I'll give you my interpretation of what the ending meant. Alright, let's get started. At the end of the drama, Zhou Zichu's days are numbered because he pulled out all of the nails by himself, and even Da Wu has no means to save him. He decides to spend his remaining days stopping the Scorpion King and Prince Jin from opening the armory. So we finally get to see this armory that we've been hearing about the entire drama um, and when the scorpion goes to the armory, he finds out that the key that Lin Keqing had given him turns out to be fake. Zhou Zishu shows up and he starts an avalanche which kills the scorpion king and his entire army. Lin Keqing shows up in the nick of time and he produces the real key which allows him and Zhou Zishu to escape the avalanche and enter the once they're inside, they discover that it does indeed contain what was promised, all of the manuscripts containing the techniques of the various Jianghu sects and clans. It also contains the Yin Yang book and the Combined Six Cultivation Power. That's a terrible translation, but I couldn't come up with anything better. Um, anyways, you know what I'm talking about. Lin Keqing tells Zhou Zushu that actually, the Combined Six Cultivation Power can keep him alive but he'll have to live the way that Ye Bai Yi lived. Um, that is, he's going to have to stay in a really cold place and only eat snow and ice for the rest of his life. So the two of them sit down together and start practicing this cultivation power. And at this point, it's looking like this is going to be the thing that's going to save Zhou Zishu's life. However, once Zhou Zishu reaches a point in his practice where he's unable to hear or see anything, Wen Keqing tells him the truth which is that in order for this power to save a life, someone else must be willing to sacrifice his own life, acting as a furnace or as a conduit for the power. Supposedly when this happens, the person that's making the sacrifice, all of his meridians will be destroyed and his hair will turn white overnight. Wu Keqing tells Zhou Zishu that the person that's left behind suffers more and therefore, as the senior person, he hopes that Zhou Zishu will allow Wu Keqing to go first. And the episode ends with Zhou Zishu waking up and seeing that Wen Keqing is losing consciousness and that all of his hair has turned white. Zhou Zishu grips his fingers really tightly and then the scene fades. In the final scene of this drama, we see a grown-up Cheng Ling talking to a group of younger disciples and telling them the story of the two brothers in the cave. The kids ask him whether the brothers survived and Cheng Ling is interrupted by his daughter and Gao Xiaoyan and then they all go off to lunch together and that's the way that the drama ends. So at the end of episode 36, a reasonable interpretation then is that this is a tragedy ending where Wen Keqing sacrificed his life in order for Zhou Zishu to live on. But even then you have to wonder why Cheng Ling didn't look a little more upset when he was telling the story to his disciples. And it turns out that this isn't the actual ending. There is a separate Easter egg scene that was released which shows Zhou Zishu on a snowy mountaintop giving pointers to a young disciple. A voice behind him questions his directions and we see Wen Keqing appear with snowy white hair and he's bathed in this glowy light. The two of them smile at each other and they start fighting together. Deng Quan, who is the father of the disciple, shows up and tells his son that these two have been fighting all their lives and once they're at it, there's no stopping them. The drama ends with Zhou Zishu and Wen Keqing's palms pressed against each other's. So what actually happened? Is everything in the Easter egg scene real? Or was Wen Keqing simply a figment of Zhou Zishu's imagination? Wen Keqing did have a glow about him, which made him look surreal almost. Um, but my interpretation of that is not that he's not real, but rather it's signifying that Wen Keqing no longer sees himself as living in the darkness. He's finally acquired the light that he craved all of his life, and he's living under the sunlight with his love, Zhou Zishu. So then the problem is, how do we reconcile this Easter egg scene with what happened at the end of episode 36? Now, before we talk about my analysis, let's just quickly mention what happened at the end of the novel that this drama was based on. 
Um, the novel ending doesn't really offer any answers, it only offers hints. And that is because the events of the novel differ pretty dramatically from the drama towards the end. So basically at the end of the novel, Da Wu does cure Zhou Zishu. Um, and the price of that cure is that Zhou Zishu has to live the rest of his life in an extremely cold place. And that's exactly what happens. Zhou Zishu, Wen Keqing, and Cheng Ling end up living together in the Changming Mountains. This means that what's shown in the Easter egg scene is pretty consistent with what happened at the end of the novel. Back to the drama. I believe the key to understanding what the drama was trying to show is Ye Bai Yi. Ye Bai Yi has a monologue towards the end of episode 36 and it's played as Wen Keqing is making his sacrifice. And this is what the monologue says. The combined six cultivation power rages fiercely and cannot be borne by a body of flesh and blood. Someone must be willing to make a sacrifice and act as a furnace and transfer the refined qi to the practitioner in order to break and reform and then emerge from the valley of death. But for the person that makes the sacrifice, all of his meridians will be destroyed and his hair will turn white overnight. Once upon a time, someone made that sacrifice and left me to live all of these years bearing the curse of that power. It turns out that I have lived all of these years in order so that I can enable the events of today. From this speech, I think we can understand a few things. Ye Bai Yi sees his long life as a curse, but he's continued to live on because someone he loved once made a sacrifice. This person is Rong Changqing, um, who is the person that Ye Bai Yi has loved all of his life. Rong Changqing married another woman and had Rong Xuan, and it's not clear whether Rong Changqing felt the same way about Ye Bai Yi as Ye Bai Yi did about him. In any case, Ye Bai Yi's love for Rong Changqing was unrequited. The second point is that Ye Bai Yi sees his role at the end of the drama as enabling Zhou Zishu and Wen Keqing to have the kind of ending that he and Rong Changqing did not. If what actually happened was that Wen Keqing sacrificed his life and only Zhou Zishu lived on, then Ye Bai Yi wouldn't have enabled any kind of good ending. I think this is what the drama was trying to tell us. Ye Bai Yi transferred the cultivation power to Wen Keqing and asked Wen Keqing to sacrifice his life in order to save Zhou Zishu, but he knew that actually both of them would survive. I think this is the case because Ye Bai Yi knows the pain of living on when the person that you have loved has died, so why would he wish a similar fate onto Zhou Zishu? Why would he propose a solution to Wen Keqing that would cause Zhou Zishu just as much pain as Ye Bai Yi himself has suffered all of these years? That really doesn't make any sense to me. That wouldn't be enabling Wen Keqing and Zhou Zishu. Rather, that would be cursing Zhou Zishu in the same way that Ye Bai Yi considers himself to be cursed. I do think that Wen Keqing did believe that he was sacrificing his life when he started practicing the cultivation power with Zhou Zishu. And the reason here is Ye Bai Yi asked Wen Keqing whether he would be willing to sacrifice his life to save Zhou Zishu. And Wen Keqing said, without hesitation, yes. And so I think likely the way that this cultivation power works is that a person must be willing to make the sacrifice in order for both people to survive. And therefore, because Wen Keqing was willing to sacrifice his life in order to save Zhou Zishu, his life was not taken and ultimately they both survived. Here are some other hints that point to the fact that Wen Keqing and Zhou Zishu had a happy ending and that Wen Keqing did not die. In the last scene when Cheng Ling was telling the story, he really didn't look very sad. His expression and his tone was really not what you would have if you were talking about the death of your two beloved masters. Um, also, his daughter, her name was Nian Xiang, which means missing Xiang. And the Xiang here, of course, is A Xiang. Um, so my point here is that if one or more of his masters had died, then you would think that her name would refer to one of them instead. In the Easter egg scene, Deng Kuan refers to the fact that these two have been fighting all of their lives. So this really undermines the idea that Wen Keqing was just a figment of Zhou Zishu's imagination. Another interesting point is that it's highly likely that Deng Kuan and Gao Xiaolian are now married. They were betrothed at the beginning of the drama. Um, so in the Easter egg scene, Deng Kuan says to his son, let's go home and eat, mother is waiting for you. Given that we see Gao Xiaolian with Cheng Liang in the other scene, I think it's very likely that the newly constructed Four Seasons Manor is very close to the snowy mountain where Zhou Zishu and Wen Keqing are living out their days. And finally, in the scene where Cheng Liang is talking to his disciples, the dubbing does not match the screenplay that was initially filmed. 
And this is not the only place in the drama where this is the case. There are many, many other instances where it was obvious that what was initially said when the drama was filmed is different to um, the words that were put in in the dubbing. And the reason there is that, you know, a lot of the times when the, when the original screenplay was too flirtatious or too romantic, they definitely toned it down in the dubbing. I'm not going to talk about all the other instances because there are so many. It could be a video all on its own. I'm just going to talk about this scene. So in this scene, this is what the dubbed version said. Cheng Ling said, if you want to practice this power, there must be someone who is willing to sacrifice himself and make his body a furnace and transfer the refined qi to the practitioner, regardless of how strong your martial arts is. Even if you don't die immediately, all of your meridians will eventually break. Very clever lip readers on the internet have deciphered what Cheng Lian was actually saying in the original screenplay. And this is what he said. If you want to practice this cultivation power, two people must have the same heart, protect each other, and wholeheartedly view each other as soulmates, and remain in love with each other in order to transfer the qi and surpass the difficulties. With this cycle repeating endlessly, the two can together become mutually protected non-dying beings. This is obviously a pretty different message to what the dub version said um, and is very supportive of the idea that the drama originally intended it to be very obvious that the two survived together. Now that I've hopefully convinced you that Wen Keqing and Zhou Zishu were supposed to have a clearly happy ending, let's talk about why the ending was instead made ambiguous. I think the first answer has to be censorship. If you've seen The Untamed, you'll remember that the ending there was also left ambiguous. I think there must be some sort of unstated or stated rule um, from the Censorship Bureau that a BL drama can't show the two male leads living a happy life that resembles marriage. That's why in these dramas they either need to have a bad ending like there was in Guardian or a ambiguous ending where it's not that obvious that the two are living happily ever after. I think there might be a couple of other reasons why they chose to make it ambiguous, and these are sort of more commercial reasons. Um, first of all, the ambiguous ending creates a lot of hype and discussion, and for drama that's already so popular, you know, all this ambiguity gets fans really worked up, which is, you know, arguably a good thing. And lastly, of course, you had to pay extra money to watch the Easter egg scene. I paid an extra dollar, I think, on Yoku, even though I already had a Yoku VIP membership. Yoku probably saw this as an easy way to make a lot of money because, think about it, if you're a big fan, you watch episode 36, it's super sad when Kushin has died, and you're like, oh my god, please tell me that's not the real ending. And then you find out there's an Easter egg scene and you're like, yes, please, I need to watch it, click, you know, take my money. So it was a clever move by Yoku that made them tons of money. All right, so there you have it. Please let me know if you agree or disagree with anything that I've said. I am thinking about making another video talking about all of the BL hints in Word of Honor. If that's something you'd like to see, then um, please hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Alright, thank you very much for watching. I will see you all next time.